Hey geeks, I hope you had a great Christmas. Uh, last night I watched Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon on Netflix. I watched it twice. I watched it the first time and then I took some time to uh, send some text messages to my boy Foz. And um, then I watched some, some uh, videos that reviewed the movie. And then I went back and I watched the movie a second time. Uh, if I watched it a second time, I guess you could probably tell them that I liked the movie. <laughs> I liked it very much. Um, I, uh, th I, I don't want this channel to be mainly about uh, talking about movies and television so much. Uh, my, my goal is, uh, is to focus mostly on comics and books. Um, but I felt like uh, this warranted a video. Um, this morning I made a 50 minute video on this topic and for some reason my laptop just did not save that video to the hard drive. I don't know why. It, it definitely was recording. I could see the little ticker up there, uh, but the file just went it just, just into the ether. It just never, it didn't go anywhere. It never happened. Uh, which is probably for the better now because I kind of went on a rant now that I've had some time to cool off a bit. Um, it's in the evening now and, and you know maybe I'll be a bit more subdued. So I don't want my channel to be kind of like one of these channels where frankly they're beginning to monetize f fandom hate. Um, and I think that's unhealthy and it's kind of what the what the purpose of this video is in conjunction with, with this film because I think this film exposes some of the cracks um, in a lot of the channels, uh, cracks in the armor. Now there's a lot of YouTube channels that are for geeks and I, and I agree a lot of, with a lot of what they say. Uh, I do think that Disney uh, with Marvel and, and Star Wars and Indiana Jones has really missed the mark big time. Um, I think Warner Brothers with DC to a lesser extent. Um, but I think what's happening is unfortunate now in that, in that films that probably deserve more recognition are being unfairly, um, unfair, unf unfairly boycotted or, or just negative review bombed, um, I think in some cases by people who didn't even watch the movie. They just had a template in a drawer someplace that they just, they just uh, you know, they just broke out and, uh, and then posted it, you know, after... Um, said property had uh, had had you know streamed or come out in theaters. And, uh, Rebel Moon is a perfect example of that. So Zack Snyder is a is an interesting filmmaker because um, the guy cannot win with anybody other than the people that that are his acolytes. Which I am not a Zack Snyder acolyte. I am not a Snyder bro. I wasn't even really aware or cared who he was until I saw Batman versus Superman. Um, when I first saw 300 in the theater, I thought it was very interesting because of the visuals, but that's the only time I saw it. I'm not really a fan of the movie, you know, and I didn't even, you know, I didn't even care who the director was, you know, I just thought, oh, well, here, here's some B movie that just, you know, had some interesting special effects and it just became a, you know, a surprise hit. Um, and then when Watchmen came out, I, I, you know, when the first time I saw it, I thought it was I thought I thought it was garbage. So uh, now I think it's probably one of the best superheroes ever su superhero movies ever made. And in fact, it improves on the source material. It's better than the Alan Moore comic. Um, but that's a topic for another video. Um, and I think, as I've said on this channel before, I think Batman versus Superman is a is a superhero movie masterpiece, as is his cut of the Justice League. Um, and I think what he was doing with DC, the Snyder verse, um, it's a shame that he wasn't able to finish it because I think that he had some really good ideas. And I think he brought a completely different pastiche to superhero films that Marvel <clears throat> wasn't doing. It, it stood in, in excellent contrast to what Marvel was doing at the time. And Marvel insists on keep doing and, and, and has turned it up to 11, it's turned their formula up to 11, and, and that's why the Marvel movies of the past five years or, or since Endgame pretty much suck, um, you know, because they've just, they've just worn out their own, you know, their own formula. Um, DC, at least, I think, you know, they've tried to do a few things differently, you know, um, in terms of tone and uh, approach. You know, um, Black Adam is a vastly different movie than James Gunn's Suicide Squad. Um, 
you know, where is, is quantum mania actually that different than Thor four, you know? So, um, I think, I think Warner brothers, you know, rolled the dice and took a little chance, a little bit more chances with the DC films. It's a shame that Snyder got um, pushed pushed out, you know, in the Discovery Warner Brothers merger and, and so forth, and all of that stuff is well documented. Um, I, I felt like the Justice League Snyder cut was a uh, victory for people being able to realize their creative vision in the face of a corporate and media gatekeeping um, hierarchy. Um, the Snyder cut was never supposed to come to the light of day. Uh, Warner Brothers wanted to go with the, you know, superior ass hat version that Joss Whedon had created off the back of uh, Snyder's hard work uh, in the process destroyed pr pretty much his own reputation. <laughs> and rightfully so. Joss Whedon is a horrible person. I'm sorry, but he just is. Um, so anyway, with Rebel Moon... Um, what we have is a situation here that wasn't completely unexpected. Um, the woke DEI people hate Snyder because they think that he's right wing. And the right wing people hate Snyder because they think that he's woke. <laughs> so the guy cannot win. He can't win. Um, and I believe that his style of filmmaking is... I can't believe I'm saying this in 2023 because the guy's been making movies now for almost 20 years but I think the guy is still ahead of his time um, and if you go back and you look at especially Batman versus Superman there's a ton of people that hated that movie when it came out um, when I saw it in a theater I gave it basically a C plus you know it wasn't until I saw the much superior director's cut the so-called Ultimate Edition, the R-rated version of it on Blu-ray, that I realized that that was an incredibly thought-provoking and well-thought-out and um, subtly philosophical mu movie. And uh, it's it's what put him on the map with me. You know, I realized, oh, okay, so this guy made Man of Steel also, which, again, I, I didn't even care who the director was. I, so, I was so... Um, so mired in admiration of the Marvel films, I was like, oh, I'll go see these DC movies, though. Um, and now I just, I love his entire trilogy now, you know. So, um, but he gets unfairly tarnished, in my opinion, by both, he's everybody's favorite whooping boy now. What people fail to understand is that Snyder makes films uh, that are heavily drawn from Japanese cinema. Uh, he's actually more of a Japanese director and creator than he is an American, even though he is an American citizen. Um, but if you watch a lot of Japanese cinema, and I assume that some of these people on these YouTube channels that purport to be critics and commentators have watched their fair amount of Asian cinema. You have, haven't you? Um, otherwise you might want to punch the geek card or fill in a few of the spaces on your geek card. Like, you've seen anime, correct? Especially the Showa style from the 80s, which tends to have um, a lot of over-dramatization, especially in their space opera. So go back and watch uh, Space Battleship Yamato or Captain Harlock or you know, anything in the Leiji-verse, um, Galaxy Express 999. Uh, there is an approach to filmmaking, and, and, and I think it was really, I think it's really inspired by anime, um, where there's almost a over, I don't want to say over-dramatization, but a heavy, heavy dramatization, a very operatic, uh, almost Greek tragedy approach to the story and to the construction of the scenery in terms of the the slow-mo use which Snyder is uh, well known for and the musical score you know which can border on over the type top which Snyder is well known for with with, with the use of Hans Zimmer and and now the great Tom Holkenberg aka Junkie XL um, this has been his approach to filmmaking um, and, you know, very, very visual, very, very saturated 
visual style. Um, this has been his approach to filmmaking since the beginning of his career. And for some people, I don't know, they have a problem with that. I, I think that people sort of like the more bland, sterile approach to movies, which is not what you want in sci-fi fantasy, right? Am I correct in that? Or do we want something that looks, you know, like this Percy Drab, was this Percy... Percy Jackson? Is that what it is? Percy Jackson show on Disney Plus. I got nothing against that YA series. I don't know that much about it. I didn't see the movie or whatever, but the trailer was so underwhelming for it. I mean, it looks like they 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 made it on a budget of about fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. You know, um and and it's get I think it's got like a ninety two percent on Rotten Tomatoes, you know, with the critics. Um I'm just saying that the show doesn't look visually appealing to me. And that's supposed to be a fantasy type show. And it looks like somebody did some cut and paste CGI on, you know, down at the uh, retention pond in, you know, in, 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 you know, in Topeka, Kansas behind the Walmart, <laughs> which is so, substituting as the lake scene. I don't know. It just... So Snyder doesn't go, he doesn't go for that. He is going to up the ante in terms of visual aspects uh, as much as possible. He's going to go heavy on the CGI, um, you know, which like, ooh, shame on him. <laughs> but everybody else is doing it, you know. Um, so he is is a filmmaker that, is able to craft stories that I think go over a lot of people's heads, and I think I think I think Batman versus Superman went over a lot of people's heads. Now, part of the problem, though, uh, part of the reason he's a magnet for criticism is the studios keep meddling in his work, and you know he'll create these two and a half to three to four hour epics, and then they'll they'll trim it down. And I guess he has no control over that or or he does, you know, but they, you know, they just the studios exert their power. And so he winds up with an hour and a half, an hour and 45 move, minute movie. And it's a mess. It's an editing botched mess. And that's what happened to Batman versus Superman. And that is what happened to a certain extent to Rebel Moon. Now, despite that, I thought that Rebel Moon accomplished what it was supposed to, which was, it was first and foremost supposed to be entertaining. Do, do we remember entertaining? Um, entertaining, popcorn, um, you know, action, uh, visually interesting. Um, and when you look at the film, it's very visually interesting. So set design, excellent. Backdrop scenes, excellent. Um, costuming, excellent. A lot of diversity in the costuming. Uh, very, uh, I heard. I heard one reviewer complaining about the diversity of the costumes and the sets. That's what you, I think you would find in a universe. So again, you go back to some of like go back to Galaxy Express nine nine nine. They go to these different planets, and so one planet looks like it's a straight up Western planet, but it's the year you know twenty two thirty seven. You know, you go to another planet, and it looks like Coruscant from George Lucas's Star Wars, A Phantom Menace. You know, it's just a built up city. You know, so the idea being that all these different planets evolve in different ways, and they're at different points in their history, but they're all connected by space travel now. So some planets are still kind of like in settlement pioneer mode, but spaceships are landing, and you know, that's what makes the fantasy element to it. I don't understand why critics don't get that. Do you don't understand that? Or do you have an agenda? Because if you have an agenda to just bash, you know, uh, knee-jerk bash certain film creators because you disagree with their, what you perceive to be their politics or their, their personal life or their personality or whatever, then you shouldn't be probably putting yourself out there as a critic or a commentator, you should just label yourself as something else. I don't know. Um, maybe a politician. I, I, I don't know. But there are a lot of people that aren't looking objectively at um, a lot of movies, not just Rebel Moon, but Aquaman 2 is another victim 
Um, I've heard from trusted sources that this is a fun movie. It's a great follow-up to the first movie. Um, and it's basically the same formula as the first movie. It's it's a unabashed, cheesy, big wet kiss to the superhero genre with a lot of flashy visuals and the personality of a Jason Momoa and an other you know other great cast members around him. And it makes no bones to be anything other than that. But still, no, we got to trash it. We got to trash it because we're angry. We're mad. We're mad at all the woke BS in the film. So we're going to take it out on, on, you know, even on decent films. We're going to boycott. We're not going to go see it. But furthermore, we're going to trash it on YouTube. Now, if you want to boycott, be my guest. There's plenty of stuff I don't watch anymore, you know. Um, so, you know, but... So that's not my beef. My beef mainly are these reviews that basically really have nothing to do with the film. It's got more to do with the reviewer and their, um, you know, their their need to be able to trash and tear down something or someone or an entire creative team and, you know, their effort because they just have some personal beef with them or some political political beef with them. Now, you know, and I don't even blame it on the YouTube YouTubers. I blame it really on the studios and a lot of the creators who brought this upon themselves. So unfortunately, unfortunately though, what we have is a situation where it's become full circle. You have this sort of, you know, right leaning YouTube channels now that are echo chambering each other. Um, and you can see it now with Rebel Moon, especially, but you know, Aquaman and, there are other things like Rings of Power that they criticize, and rightfully so. You know, so again, I agree with a lot of what these guys say, but I think that everybody needs to kind of st step back and take a deep breath and really begin to assess stuff that's coming out on a case by case basis. Because, you know, Hollywood doesn't have to make these movies; they don't have to sign a contract with Kathleen Kennedy or or uh, Zack Snyder, or George Lucas, you know, to bring him back, you know, or, you know, they don't have to do sci-fi anymore. They, they don't, Marvel, it's already happening to Marvel. You're getting one movie next year. One. One Marvel movie. Okay? Um, so, you know, after that, you may not get any at all. If Deadpool 3 doesn't perform, they may just shit can the whole MCU. And the same goes for, for, for James Gunn. You know, before it even gets off the ground, because why would you? Why would you make 150? You can trim the budgets on these things. Let's say you, you you're down to 150 million, which Snyder made Rebel Moon, both parts for 150 million. You can trim these down. You can tell these guys 100 million, 150 million tops. Maybe another 75 million advertising. You know, uh, we're going lean and mean. Okay, um, but. You know, that's not going to solve the problem of getting people back into theaters and getting people out of this mode of where they're going to have a hissy fit for everything that comes out now. You know, so they could just pull back and say, you know what, we're just not going to invest in science fiction, fantasy, superhero. Um, we're just going to go with crime and rom-com and uh, comedy. Um, you know, comedy is something that, you know, you don't see many comedies anymore. They could, they could you know, they're, they're cheap and they, re they usually return a profit. Horror movies have come back. You know, we could see growth in that because they're cheap and they usually turn a profit. So, you know, why do I even want to be in the superhero game anymore? Because even if I have a good creator and I create a good product, it, you know, it's just going to get, you know, completely ravaged on YouTube. Now, we all know the studios pay professional critics to, uh, to go one way or the other. Apparently, Netflix didn't pay off enough critics um, on Rotten Tomatoes, who is, by the way, owned by NBC Universal, um, to, for the most part. So, um, you know, 40 minutes into the movie last night, I was thinking, what are these other critics talking about? Like, did they see the same movie as I did? So, you know, I had to pause it. And one of the cool things about streaming is, is you can intermission anytime you want. And, um, you know, Rebel Moon is a two-part movie, so it's really an episode. It's really an episodic situation here, and yeah, you know, I disagree with Netflix's decision here. Uh, I don't think that um, they should have um, 
I don't I don't like this approach of like we're gonna we're gonna release a PG thirteen version that's an hour and forty seven minutes and then we're gonna release an R rated three hour version which is clearly going to be the superior version because it's going to be the full realization of Zack Snyder's vision. Um, so you're gonna have two versions out there and everybody's gonna gravitate eventually towards the three hour version because it's gonna be the better film. So you know they cut so much out of the out of this part one, A Child of Fire, that there was almost no character development whatsoever, other than for the main character, for Korra. Um, and a little bit for Charlie Hoonan's character and for the guy that played the farmer. Um, so Korra is played by Sofia Butella, who did, I think, a, a, a very good job. Um, Michael Hoosman uh, was... Uh, was um, the, the farm guy. I'm not really familiar with him. Charlie Hoonan, we all know him. Uh, he's one of the mercenaries. He's kind of the Han Solo type dude. And so what gets me about these reviews uh, that are trashing the film is, A, they act as though they didn't know that this film was a retelling of The Magnificent Seven. Like, how the fuck could you not know that? <laughs> I mean, everybody knows. Don't pretend you didn't know that, okay? You... So these guys, a lot of these guys are just, I'm sorry, you're beclowning yourself, okay? Um, a lot of people pretend like they didn't know that this movie was sort of like also inspired by Akira Kurosawa, the Japanese filmmaker. Probably his greatest work is Ran, R-A-N. I highly recommend you see that film. Uh, the, more so they want to focus on, well, is it as good as Star Wars? Well, yeah, it's way better than Star Wars, the most recent Star Wars. Is it better than George Lucas' Star Wars? No, of course not. Let's be, let's be you know, we're, let's be intelligent adults, okay? Um, but is it better than the crap that Disney has been, you know, pushing through their streaming sewer pipe service? Yes, it's much better than that. Um, now, is it better than the the golden nuggets of turds that are coming out of Disney Plus, like The Mandalorian? Um, I don't know. It's a movie versus, you know, an episode, you know, a, a series. Um, it's hard to say, you know. If it were a series, I would probably say it wasn't as good as Mandalorian Season 1 and 2. Um, but as a film, it's definitely better than any of the Star Wars films that have come out. Uh, since The Force Awakens. Um, you know, so it was also inspired by comic books, specifically Heavy Metal Magazine, which I've covered on this channel before, and it's covered extensively in other parts of the internet. Um, real quick, Heavy Metal was basically, uh, a, it was a European-based comics anthology magazine format that was that was hitting its stride in the 80s. And uh, the, the quality of the artwork was, was, was fantastic. It was blowing away anything that Marvel and DC were doing at the time. But, I mean, it was, a, it was a completely different take. They were more adult stories. There was violence. There was nudity in the stories and so forth. You know, it wasn't bound by the comics code that American comics are, uh, are bound by. So, um, so I think a lot of visuals from heavy metal kind of make its way. And of course, everybody's familiar with the heavy metal movie, although I'm beginning to question if some of these reviewers who trash this film are familiar with the heavy metal movie. And again, if you're not and you're watching this, then check your geek card, okay? Go back and watch the heavy metal movie. Uh, and watch the heavy metal 2000 movie too, which is inferior to the first one, but watch it anyway um so you know if you look at snyder's body of work though he's always been heavily influenced i think by by japanese cinema so you know and everybody should know that by now like he's got enough of a resume that you know what you're going to get with a snyder product you know you're going to get a lot of slow-mo <laughs> a lot you know um but nobody does slow-mo better than snyder and I think one of the reasons he does it is because, one, it makes him unique to the other filmmakers. Two, I think it makes the action scenes more, um, I guess I would say, more relatable or understandable. You know, some fight scenes in, in superhero movies or even martial arts movies are so fast, you're not even sure what the hell just happened. 
you know. I think he uses it to the effect of, you know, one, it sort of stretches out the, the scene itself, but it also lets the music score uh, really expand. So it gives Hulkenberg a, an opportunity to really implement some oomph to the action. And he does this in, to great effect in the Justice League movie, especially at the end when they're attacking um, Steppenwolf's lair. Um, in Batman's driving around in the Batmobile fighting off the parademons. Uh, it's a classic scene. Uh, maybe I'm just wired differently. I don't, I fail to see why anyone who, any geek would watch that and be like, oh, that, that sucks. That, that's not even visually interesting. That, that's crap. <laughs> I, 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 but, but, you know, you'll, you'll get all excited about, you know, Obi-Wan and Darth Vader squaring off in, in, in Obi-Wan, you know, which is just poor, poorly designed and constructed and just what a botched and wasted effort by Disney. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry, actually. Fuck Disney. So, um, you know, that's the other thing. A lot of these same guys that are trash in Rebel Moon uh, have been, you know, griping about Disney, griping about Warner Brothers, griping about Paramount, you know, uh, oh, all the reboots, all the retreads, all the retcons. Uh, you know, it, it, somebody's got to make something new. Here comes Snyder with a whole new galactic space opera universe. And what do you do? You DOA it. You dead on arrival it. You just bomb the hell out of it. You know, so you again, you want new stuff and then you get it and then it's like, oh, that's garbage. Oh, Snyder is so self-indulgent. What does that mean when a filmmaker is self-indulgent? What does that mean? Can anybody explain that to me? Um, can anyone explain to me why tropes are a bad thing? Um, because trope is one of those words that they pull out of their lazy critic tool bag to attack creators. Um, in fact, let's look at this one. This is on Rotten Tomatoes. Wendy Eyed from Observer UK. Oh, I'm, I'm sure she's a, she's a card-carrying geek. The story is a derivative mess that feels as though it was assembled from bits of plot picked off the carcasses of other better films and glued together with brain-numbing, pace-killing chunks of exposition. <laughs> Wendy, how many how many stories have you told in your life? Uh, have you written any nonfiction or fiction books, comics? Have you made any short films? Um, let's see, what else do we have? There are endless hunks of spoken exposition. There is a lot of space travel. <laughs> it's a fucking science fiction movie. Of course there's a lot of space travel. That's like saying, oh, who, this is Donald Clark from the Irish Times. Have you seen 2001? There's a lot of space travel in that movie. Oh, pff, oh pff, that movie sucked. Oh, it's right, it's right. Star Wars, it's, they're, they're flying around in spaceships around the Death Star. There's a lot of space travel. Okay, all right. A great many uninteresting people are introduced. Okay, well, that is legit. Again, that's that's the editing job. That's the editing job. Clearly, you can find chunks in this film where you know that there were like several scenes shot around the introduction of, of new characters, but Netflix just yanked those scenes. So those are going to be in the three-hour cut. It sucks, though, that we, we kind of get a teaser movie before we get the actual full movie. That's really what this is. It's a marketing misstep, um, and it's created a whole other Snyder cut. You know, it, it, and it's like Netflix played it up. They're like, "Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna let Zach roll out Rebel Moon, our version of it, the ones that we cut." You know, but don't worry, there's a Snyder cut of Rebel Moon Part One, A Child of Fire, that we're gonna let Zach roll out. We're not gonna resist him like Warner Brothers did on Max. You know, for all that period of time, and then they finally relented. No, we're gonna let Snyder, you know, realize his full. Oh, why not just let the guy realize his full for, full vision right off the bat? Just release the three-hour R-rated movie. It would have probably done a lot better. It might have won over a few more skeptical critics. Anyway, let's continue with Donald Clark's review. By the first hour, all narrative drive has slackened into a limp connecting thread. Um, I would actually argue it happened faster than that. 
so so Donald, you know, so yeah, the first 30, 30 to 35 minutes of the movie is fantastic. The, the, the tension that ratchets up, um, you know, when, when this, this evil force comes to visit the farm planet that the main character lives on, um, you know, is palpable because you know something bad's going to happen. Uh, you know some violence is going to break out. And these are a peaceful people, you know. So, um, but after that, when it gets into, you know, her getting the mission to go out and, and get the characters uh, to assemble the team to defend the farm, um, that's when it kind of starts to lose its, its, uh, its narrative because they just, it's a lot of, it's like they'll literally meet someone, that someone will like fight somebody, and then like the next thing you know, that someone's on the ship and they're off going to meet someone else. And, you know, it's all done very cool though. It all looks very cool. <laughs> it's got great music, the visuals again. Um, I heard the guy at Film Threat say, oh, you know, the, the film's so dark. It's like he just ran it through Instagram filters and he, and he pushed everything to dark, you know. Um, I, it, definitely the Instagram filters, but that's Snyder's, that's what Snyder does, you know. You're going to get high saturation. Um, but really, though, if you look at Joss Whedon's Justice League versus Snyder's Justice League, Z Whedon like turned up the the red saturation to to twelve, man. You know that movie just looks like it's just there's almost too much color in it. And this is coming from a guy who's an artist, and I love color. You know, Snyder actually toned it down a little bit, but it was still very colorful. Um, I think maybe you know maybe Snyder did darken the tint of the film a bit, probably to try to satisfy his endless critics. Because had he just gone ahead and made it look like Justice League. Uh, or even, or even um, Sucker Punch, if you're familiar with that film by him, they would have been like, well, it's, it's oversaturated. It's just so much color. Oh, like, like color's a bad thing, you know? Personally, in sci-fi space opera, sci-fi fantasy space opera, I want a lot of color. I want, I want space to look like Jack Kirby drew it. Man, I want like super freaking novas and nebulas and... And you know what? In Snyder's version of space, you get that. You get all kinds of worlds floating around. You don't even know what the hell they're doing, what they are. Or who, you know, there's just there's stars. There's big neutron stars and nebula everywhere. It looks beautiful. The space shots look beautiful. But oh no, there's too much space travel on that film. While Snyder may do his best to invent a dark, gripping universe to engross viewers, Rebel Moon is a limp, soulless regurgitation of tropes stolen from much more formidable films tropes there's that word again Woo -hoo. oh lord derivative tropes so um i want all these reviewers to go back into time and watch to 1977 and watch a movie that came out on may 22nd called star wars and tell me how many tropes you can detect in that film uh because there's a lot there's a lot. There's probably more than what you found in Rebel Moon. But no, when Snyder does tropes... <sighs> Come on, man. Give me a break. You guys are lazy. You critics are lazy. You got no skin in the game. You got no skin in the game. Speaking of those who do have skin in the game, so Critical Drinker. Now, look, I've met the guy. He's a fantastic guy. I respect him. I like his channel. I've read his book, Dark Harvest. He's got skin in the game, but he absolutely eviscerated Rebel Moon, eviscerated it. And I'm like, I, I, look, if you didn't like the movie, dude, cool. But I mean, there was a hatred to the commentary that it felt personal, you know, it felt personal to me. Like he's got some issue with Snyder. And really he, he does, if you look at his other videos on any of Snyder's work. Um... And again, I, 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 I can't exactly pinpoint what his issue with Snyder's work is, but, you know, let's give credit where credit is due, you know. But no, he just, he completely eviscerated it. It's probably one of the worst, uh, most hateful reviews of a film and of a creator I'd ever seen before. You know, I don't know, maybe Snyder stole his bottle of Jack or something. I don't know, but I disagree. And... You know, but I respect the guy because he's, you know, he's come out and said, look, I, you know, I'm writing some books because I figure, hey, if I'm going to put myself out there and I'm going to review stuff, you know, I need to have some skin in the game. I need to, I, you know, I need to talk the talk and walk the walk. OK, but I got to tell you, dude, I read Dark Harvest and I barely remember it, but I will remember Rebel Moon. 
I will remember Rebel Moon for a very long time. I'm just saying. Like the Death Star obliterating planets, Zack Snyder is out to topple countless innocent genres. <laughs> so borrowing from genres now is a bad thing. Like that's that's verboten. We we can't. We, and yet every freaking superhero, sci-fi, fantasy, even horror movies are are you know borrow from the genres and 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 enact tropes and become derivative and recycle plots jj abrams jj <laughs> abrams you know and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't that's why we have a free market so i mean you want to talk about recycling plots jj abrams is your boy you know and sometimes it works most of the time it doesn't but sometimes it does work you know I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not one to bash his, his Star Trek films so much. Um, you know, I, I was actually pleasantly surprised by all three. I went in with low expectations, you know. Um, and, you know, you know I, I think his take on Star Trek is not in, in alignment with what I want Star Trek to be. But when I just, when I let go of trying to make the world fit into what I want, they became just, purely enjoyable popcorn movies with with pretty good casts you know pretty good cast casting so you know but are they classics no you know do they live up to the standard of first contact or or the motion picture or wrath of khan hell no hell no we all know that come on so can i find any positive reviews let's see here let's look at the audience score. so it's 25 percent on the critics and we all know the critics are just, most of them are paid off hacks. So this, the audience scores 63%. That one's got me a little flummox, though. I, I was thinking it would probably get like a 75 or 80% score. Um, here's a two here's a two stars rating from, from, from somebody named Beto D. Look, did I enjoy it? Yes, it was worth the watch. But was it great? No, far from it, actually. The best I could describe how I feel about this film was that it felt like a sequel film. You get into these characters' lives with barely any context or buildup. That's the legit criticism, which creates the inability to buy into the entire story. I love the casting. I did, too. They had the talent for an amazing film, but scripting and character depth kept it from that. Okay, and it goes on from there. I agree with that. And again, it, I blame Netflix for their crappy editing uh, that they made Snyder do. Now, I was texting my boy Foz last night because I went on a rant, as if this one isn't ranting enough for you here on video. But um, I've got I use these as my talking points. So um, after looking at some of these these uh, reviews, let's um, first I would say if you want to see some balanced reviews of this film, go to Overlord DVD's channel and also Generation Tech. Um, if you want to see some over the top ridiculous reviews, I already mentioned a Critical Drinker, but also go to Nerdrotic. Um, he he absolutely just equates the, he thinks the entire movie is like an Antifa propaganda film. <laughs> <laughs> because he didn't like the way that some of the rebels dressed. He didn't like the face makeup they had, you know. Um, and so, you know, but let's get into that. One of the criticisms of the film is that it's woke. It's not woke, okay. It has a diverse cast, like The Expanse had a diverse cast. It just is what it is, okay. Uh, it wasn't ever shoved in your face. There was no, nobody was made to feel, nobody was belittled in the process of having a, the diverse characters in the film. Um, and, you know, diver the cast looks like what you see going to Walmart. It's diverse. America is a diverse country. So is the world, if you hadn't noticed. Um, so a diverse cast does not make a woke film. Um, they don't like the, the, the female protagonist, okay? Uh, they don't like Sophia Botella as Cora. Um, she's a Mary Sue. Um, she's not a Mary Sue. They do a great job of explaining her backstory in, in the hated exposition you know, that's one of the other knocks against it. So, oh, there's so much exposition. There's literally like really five minutes of exposition broken into two different scenes in the film. Um, it, you know, is that too much for you? You, you know, uh, if they didn't have the exposition, then, it, then then they would fall back on, well, they didn't do enough to flesh out her character. You know, so I mean, which, which is it? What, what do you want? You can't have it both ways, you know. Um, so... Her character is given plenty of backstory to explain why she's such a badass. And, um, you know, a lot of these guys, they don't like a 5'5", five, five, you know, 110-pound woman, you know, being able to beat up, 
you know, these big burly men. But if you look at her fighting style, uh, it's pretty clear, you know, that they, they kind of have her doing, I think, a Krav Maga fighting style, which um, when employed by uh, females can effectively even the playing field and they can, they can kick some ass. Like if, if a woman who was a black belt in karate fought me, she would kick my ass most likely because she knows martial arts. And martial arts is the effective force. It's, it's being able to um, be a smaller opponent to defeat a larger, stronger opponent. That's what martial arts is for the most part. That is, it's a huge part of its strategy and philosophy. Um, one would think that reviewers have seen enough martial arts movies to know this. <laughs> So, but the way they did her fighting style, you can tell, especially in the final fight that she had with the with the villain, um, you can tell um, they they put a lot of thought into how she could take this dude on and be effective in uh, in fighting him. So you know that's appreciate that's I appreciate that because the same guys that that have a problem with Cora have no problem with Black Widow, but Black Widow has no superpowers. And it's kind of the same, you know, situation. She was trained at birth in all of these martial arts fighting techniques and being trained in how to take on, in Black Widow's case, you know, basically godlike creatures, you know, supervillains. Um, and, you know, they did an excellent job with her fighting style um, in, like, especially, like, in uh, Winter Soldier, you know, when she takes on the Winter Soldier. The, the, that whole scene off the bridge when she attacks him before Captain America even gets to the Winter Soldier, go back and rewatch that scene. Um, her entire approach to him is in such that she knows that he can overpower her and throw her through a bus if she, if she is off her guard. So the way that she comes up on him, completely by surprise, first of all, and surprise is a huge part of martial arts when you, when your opponent is much stronger than you. So y'all need to check yourselves on that. Um, what was one of the other criticisms? Well, let's answer this question about Star Wars, okay? Clearly it was, um, it was supposed to be pitched as a Star Wars movie and, and Star Wars passed on it, or Kathleen Kennedy passed on it, you know? Um, it may or may not have been a right decision, I don't know. I don't want to get into that. So he, he, you know, Snyder said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to make it my own universe. So I'm going to turn this into a, you know, I'm going to find a studio to do it. And I want to do, I want to create this thing where it becomes, you know, comic books and potentially video games, and, uh, more movies and so forth. And, uh, and so he's, he's, you know, he, that's what they're trying to do with this. Again, new stuff, new franchises, trying to give birth to it, you know, and, and we're just trashing it. You know, there's this echo chamber of people that are just trashing it. Um, and you know, look, if the movie totally was a suck bomb, I would I wouldn't even make this video, wouldn't even make it. But I'm wondering, did you guys see the same movie that I saw? Because it's not a horrible movie. You know, is it a classic? Time will tell. Uh, is it good though? Is it entertaining? It absolutely is. It absolutely is. Um, let's see what else do we have here. We talked about skin in the game. We talked about. Oh yeah. Um, so the look of the film. Um, there were some people that pointed out, well, it looks like Warhammer, as if that's a bad thing. Well, you know, Warhammer, the show, the movie, or whatever it's going to be on Amazon, helmed by Henry Cavill, hasn't appeared yet. So if Snyder beat them to the punch, it's not my problem. It's not Warhammer. Well, it might be a problem with Warhammer. But, but yeah, clearly he is some of the some of the costume designs and maybe some of the sets were a little bit Warhammer. But there's, there's so much inspiration thrown into this film. It's like it, you see elements of like, you know, the Holy Roman Empire, you know, Nazism, um, you know, uh, idyllic nature settings. It's, you know, the, the farm town looks like, you know, the, the, you know, the sound of music. You know, it's it's peaceful. It's beautiful. Um, you know, people were criticizing the waterfall. That's that's a backdrop of the farm, as if like you know, oh, how dare you put them in a beautiful setting? You know, um, you know, it's just incredible to me how people just nitpick things now, and it's not serving us well. You know, and and, and we may end up losing most of this genre if we if we don't you know if we don't start injecting a little positivity where it's due. And I think in this case, some positivity is due. Um, so anyway. Yeah, so you know the movie looks too grim dark, which is a which is a genre that that Warhammer, I guess, almost pretty much invented. And look, I love Warhammer. I don't play the game, 
but I like the books and I like the artwork that accompanies it and I and I buy the comics when I can find them no one has consistently been publishing Warhammer comics I can't wait for the TV show um, I think it's going to be fantastic I think it has the potential to be a super massive hit uh, because of the people that are involved with it I, I trust them to, t to stay you know close to the source material and Warhammer is such a vast universe there's so many stories that can be told um, in in that universe and there's so many fantastic writers that have written books and comics about it and the people that 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 you know the the Games Workshop, the company that owns it, has created an incredible universe around it. There's a, there's an entire lore around it. And I said before, go to the Lupin channel if you want to get versed on, on what Warhammer 40K is. Um, but yeah, some of the film looks Warhammerish. I appreciated that as a Warhammer fan. I was like, oh, that's cool. He got some inspiration from that, too. You know, does the whole thing look like Warhammer? No, obviously not. That would be in the realm of ripoff. This is in the realm of if I'm pulling a little bit of this and a pull a little bit of that and a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, you know, when you're a fan and you're and you have the, the you're blessed with the opportunity to make movies, isn't that what you would do? Like if I were given you know his budget and and you know a team of creatives, you know, that's what I would do. You know, he makes movies similar to the way that I would probably make them. Um, so I guess that makes me an idiot and a bad person, too. You know, a self-indulgent creator, you know. Uh, it's no, it, it's just that I happen to like a certain type of, of style and a certain type of filmmaking and a certain type of, um, you know, of visual uh, motif. And, um, and so he borrows from what I think are a lot of very probably superior um, so I've been saying this for a while that, that Asian science fiction has been kicking America's butt you know if you go in and explore some of the Asian science you know not just Japan but China and Korea you know some of the some of the stuff that they make and sometimes it has subtitles and you're gonna have to read it you know and some of the anime too you know anime is not all like upskirt <laughs> you know this, people think it's like this uh, you know they have a they have the wrong impression of it you know like true true anime and true manga to me you know is was born of the of the 70s and 80s you know um and um you know it's not like you know picking up my girlfriend in a dungeon classroom you know yakuza drama you know whatever that the you know the, a lot of the popular stuff you know right now is is very different from the stuff from the 70s and 80s and 90s even and a lot of that stuff is still popular now, you know. Um, you know, if you look at you know, Yamato, Harlock, um, Star Blazers, you know, which is Gotcha Man, um, you know, Mobile Suit Gundam, bro, um, you know, um, Mazinger, you know, Go Nagai, uh, you know, stuff like that, you know, Super Sentai uh, stuff, Ultraman, um, you know, uh, even Kaiju, you know. Um, Godzilla movies where you know they bring in elements of Super Sentai um, you know so there's a there's a plethora of stuff out there uh, that serve as inspiration for a guy like Snyder and and served for the inspiration for another well-known director famous director and that was George Lucas um, and if you go and look at Gotcha Man uh, is this one that I can especially point to there are huge, huge parallels in Gotcha Man, a.k.a. Battle of the Planets, to Star Wars. And it came out before Star Wars, to the point where you could almost say that Lucas did rip them off. Okay, But I'm not going to say that, because I understand, as an artist, that every artist steals to a certain extent. I know people don't want to hear that, um, but it's true. It's true. <clears throat> so... Because most of the stories that have been told have already been told, and they were told thousands of years before any of us got in front of a word processor or a movie camera, okay? And so you just retell the stories. You take a little bit from each of your inspirational sources, and you hope that you make something unique and entertaining that will resonate and, and bring in fans and uh, and create a following for you. That's That's what you hope. That's the market, okay? But the market is not being served well now when we are just knee-jerk bashing material because we feel like we just want to teach Hollywood a lesson, you know. 
And I agree, Hollywood should be taught a lesson to a certain extent, but where it's warranted. And I don't think it's warranted with Rebel Moon. I don't think the reviews match up with the reality of what that movie is. Um, what else here? Fighting style, visuals, we've covered all that. Yeah, if you want, if you want to get away from reboots and retcons and rehashings and, 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 and re-readings and remakes of, of franchises, you know, then start supporting new ideas and new material or make your own you know we're, we're we're fast coming upon a period of time where you know you might be able to make a blockbuster in your bedroom um i mean people are doing it with music right now have been for a while so you know but with the advent of the technology now and and, and you know and yes i'm going to say it ai you know people are on the verge of being able to make uh, incredible material artistic material uh, in their bedroom and release it to the world. So, you know, I think Hollywood has more of a, has more of a, a staying power issue. You know, I, I, they may be in a situation where they have to compete with you and I here pretty soon, because if I can figure out a way to make something on the level of like a rebel moon or, or justice league, and I can do it with my own characters and my own writing, and I can do it on my laptop and release it, you know, onto a streaming platform, um, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and, and you are too. You probably will too. Uh, let's see. What else? What else? So, you know, forget, forget the negatives now. So the positives though, I found it to be highly entertaining. Um, I found it to be a highly entertaining space opera science fiction fantasy i liked that each world kind of had a different look um and i like that the visuals in in a lot of instances were very striking i love the villain the villain was fantastic i uh, definitely want to learn more about his character um the guy just you know he's just uh he's evil He's, he's evil, but he's, he's very charismatic, which evil frequently is charismatic. And I think uh, this guy, Ed Screen, I think is his name, played that, played that character very well. The acting overall was good for everybody. They just didn't give it some people enough dialogue. You know, like, like uh, was it uh, G Jimon Hansu? You know, uh, just not enough dialogue, not enough to do, which I think in the three-hour version, yes. <clears throat> Ray Fisher was excellent. Um, but he wasn't in enough of the movie, you know, um, Anthony Hopkins does the voiceover of the robot. I had somebody criticized, oh, he's trying to be like C-3PO. <laughs> and C-3PO was based on the robot from Metropolis. Okay. So, you know, so Anthony Hopkins character is Jimmy, the robot, uh, the, the robot didn't get enough screen time, uh, really, you know, the, again, that's got to be a cutting room floor situation because the robot, I think, definitely is going to play more of a central role in the next film. Um, but the robot design was cool. And there's a scene with the robot and, and one of the townspeople that was just golden. It's just it was a beautifully shot scene. It was beautifully acted. The dialogue was great. Um, you know, I, I don't see how you, you watch a scene like that and you don't see the humanity in it. You don't see the, you know, and, and that's everybody's go, oh, this is a soulless film. <clears throat> There's a lot of heart and humanity in this film. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the gist of the film is, you know, fighting back against the homogeny of the Imperium, of, of, of you know, of the totalitarian fascist, fascist you know, empire, uh, <clears throat> very much like Star Wars. So, um you know, there are moments, you know, where the, the humanity of some of the characters really shines through and, and really in Cora's character, too. Uh, she's the most fleshed out character and, and she it should be. She's the she's the main protagonist. Um, Duna Bay as Nemesis, who's like a cyborg <clears throat> sword master, loved her character. But again, not enough dialogue. You could tell there were whole scenes that were shot around her where they probably tried to convince her to join their quest and 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 this, that, and the other thing, but cutting room floor, they wound up on the cutting room floor. So, um, you know, the character looked really cool. Um, 
I heard somebody say, well, her fighting style, her sword style. Oh, so you're, you're a master swordman now? Is that, so you know all the different sword fighting styles. The scene with her where she's fighting the spider creature was awesome. Okay, And then, well, she's got lightsabers. Your swords look like lightsabers. They're not technically lightsabers. <clears throat> Excuse me. They heat up. Like, they get red hot, you know? Um, but, I mean, every freaking sci-fi movie now has lightsabers, you know? Including a lot of the Japanese sci-fi movies. Um, which, you know, frankly, I don't even think Lucas invented the lightsaber. I think you can find lightsabers in some 70s anime from Japan. So, you know, check yourselves, y'all. Do you not know the history? You need to go back and, and, and view... You know, I know some of you guys are like in your mid thirties or whatever, you know, and I'm just a 55 year old, old coot. But, um, if you're going to be out, you know, being, you know, if you're going to be a critic, then go back and learn some of the history. Okay. It would serve you well to do so. Um, we talked about the visual, the score again, I'm going to go, I'm going to sing praises for Tom Holkenberg. I think the guy's the next Hans Zimmer. I can see why Snyder continues to work with him. Um, can't wait to hear what his score is going to be like. I'll definitely listen to his score standalone from this first movie. Um, I anxiously await the second movie. I guess the th the three hour version is going to come before the 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 second part. Um, so you got to understand that Rebel Moon is one movie. It's just been cut in two, and you know, so only the first part of it. So it's almost like a two episode mini series or something. I don't know. But I do think that there's a little bit of experimentation here. And I think and Snyder, I think, is the tip of the spear because of Snyder Cut. So with streaming, you have the opportunity for creators to make these grandiose epics. And, um, you know, we need to figure out a way. Well, they need to figure out a way for the how to release these things, because this is probably six hours total of film, you know, is what he's got in the can. So do you want to release a six, six and a half hour movie? Um, for weirdos like me, yes, I would watch. That. <laughs> I will watch that. I'll take as many intermissions during it as I'll put, hit the pause button. Okay. Or, you know, should they have done the three hour versions and, and just did it like that? I think they should have done the R rated three hour versions. Can this PG-13, you know, nonsense. Um, and, and they should have just released two films, both of them three hours are rated, you know, and, and left it at that. Cause now at the end of all this, you're going to have four versions of this movie. You know, you're going to have two PG 13s and two R rated movies. And the R rated movies are going to be considered, I guarantee you the definitive versions of the film. Um, you know, so, but you know, this is still a new, you know, this is uncharted territory still, you know, the streamers are still trying to figure out what works best. Um, but I can tell you this much, if you think that, you know, the days of, oh, a movie should be just, you know, hour and 30 minutes long and, 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 you know, and that's it, you know, and it's, it should be like a one and done, or I should wait three, four years, five years for the sequel. Those days are starting to go away. I think you're going to see more of a pipeline of continuous type of filmmaking coming out, um, or they'll just start, you know, doing things where they chop them into six episodes, you know, and make it kind of a mini series thing. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I, it, it's a minor beef though, because I'm just happy to get some new science fiction space opera that's enjoyable, that's 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 fun to look at, um, and uh, and you know, it, it and it beats the pants off the recent Star Wars stuff. So I'm happy with it. That's all I've got to say for right now. Um, stay geek and I'll be back soon with more videos till then go watch Rebel Moon I think you'll like it